How do you exit a 20-year war? It's a tough question, but perhaps the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan done in a hasty, almost haphazard manner isn't the best example. As we get closer to President Biden's August 31st deadline for ending the U.S. military mission there, the news out of the country is increasingly worrying. European Union officials estimated today that Taliban insurgents now run 65 percent of Afghanistan after a series of skirmishes with Afghans across parts of the country. The U.N. estimates that almost 30 children have been killed in just the last three days of fighting between government forces and the Taliban, and more than a thousand civilians have been killed in the past month. If 20 years of this US-led war in Afghanistan has only left that country on the brink of collapse again, with the Taliban resurging to power again, and with everyday Afghans bearing the brunt of the conflict, as they have always been, it should make us question what we've been doing there for two decades. And the thing is, this sobering reality isn't a product only of our Afghan debacle. The months and years following 9-11 bore witness to the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, then a secretive and often unchecked drone war across several countries, from Pakistan to Somalia to Yemen, the backing of a violent NATO-led regime change campaign in Libya, supporting of rebels in Syria, many of whom were found linked to, be, found linked to regional extremist groups, and wars in countries across Africa so hidden under a set of classified programs that even U.S. lawmakers weren't aware of some of them. I mean, remember when four U.S. servicemen were killed during a raid in Niger in 2017? And no one seemed to know why. We don't know exactly where we're at in the world militarily and what we're doing. And if we don't like what the military does, we can defund the operation. But I didn't know there was a thousand troops in Niger. Our military campaigns abroad became so normalized that in 2016, the U.S. found itself dropping 26,171 bombs on seven countries, Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, and Somalia. Maybe, just maybe, it's become easy for many of us in the U.S. to tune out when it comes to what the U.S. military does abroad in our name, to think it doesn't affect us here at home. But what if that's not the case? What if the war on terror came home long ago? What if it's part of why Donald Trump rose to power and why January the 6th happened? That's what a new book argues. Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump is a new book by award-winning journalist Spencer Ackerman. In it, he shows how the war on terror impacted America itself, how it dismantled our civil liberties, fostered racism, nativism, and yes, eventually, Donald Trump himself. He writes, quote, the same tools that destabilize foreign countries were bound to destabilize America. Trump was the war on terror's lagging indicator, the promise of what George W. Bush unleashed and what Barack Obama nurtured. The war on terror revitalized the most barbarous currents in American history, gave them renewed purpose and set them on the march, an army in search of its general. This book tells the story of that campaign. So, with the U.S. now leaving Afghanistan, winding down that seminal chapter of our so-called war on terror, are we about to enter a new, more peaceful era? And if not, for how long will we live in the shadows of 9-11? Joining me now to discuss this is Spencer Ackerman, an award-winning journalist, author of the Substack newsletter Forever Wars, and the author of the new book, Reign of Terror. Spencer, thanks so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the new book. Before we get to that... The news out of Afghanistan looks bleaker by the day. The Taliban overrunning more towns and districts, the Afghan military asking for help, civilians fleeing, kids dying. You've been following this war since its onset, pretty much. Was this to be expected? Is this happening because we're exiting so quickly, or was it simply inevitable? I would say having, you know, in my thoughts now, people who I've met in Afghanistan uh, who you know, will forever strike me with their warmth, with their humanity, uh, that the United States tends to talk about the awful consequences of withdrawal from these countries that it destabilizes without reference to the fact that the bloodletting likely to come in Afghanistan is an outgrowth of these wars, not a result of simply deciding that we couldn't do them anymore. You know, one of the things that really comes across throughout this entire 20-year history, not just in Afghanistan, 
but across the broader war on terror, is this deep sense of American exceptionalism, which is a kind of, you know, geopolitical equivalent of what we see in, you know, this country with white innocence, refusing to look at the United States in a historical and geopolitical context, because doing so exposes really the awful things that American foreign policy does around the world. That is what we're seeing in Afghanistan. There is no 20-year war that gets turned around in year 21. And the question that is going to face yes. President Biden and a lot of other uh, members of the U.S. security agencies, not just the military, is it pro is whether they are prepared to actually end this war or will human suffering that we are surely likely to see becomes the pretext for re-escalating this war. Let's talk about your book, Reign of Terror. Interestingly, you begin telling readers about the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 by Timothy McVeigh, which was then the worst terrorist attack in the country. As you discuss, and many may not remember, it was actually Muslims who were immediately blamed in the aftermath. Congress passed legislation that was focused on foreign terrorist organizations. As you write, quote, the response to Oklahoma City was clarifying. When terrorism was white, the collective American response was to focus the machinery of its wrath anywhere else, sparing white supremacy, the expansive violence America pledged against terrorism that was foreign, Muslim, non-white. Why is this particular anecdote, that event in modern American history, so important to the story of 9-11 and our forever wars? Because it was important to see the whole war on terror. And the only way to see that is to look at what the exemptions are. And in the case of Oklahoma City, six years before the 9-11 attack, we have an example of one of simply the most devastating days in American history, traced right back to the deadliest, oldest, and most resilient form of terrorism that America has ever known. And we see all of the ways in retrospect after 9-11 that it didn't change the United States, that the United States didn't do remotely what it decided to do after 9-11 when such terrorism could be attributed to foreign people, non-white people, celebrate uh, uh, overseas who uh, practice a religion completely unfamiliar to most Americans. What we see is what the exception is that defines this era, that something so deeply American as the kind of terrorism McVeigh practiced, the way McVeigh predicated his act of terrorism on restoring what he considered to be a true America, all of that was, if you'll pardon the term, whitewashed. And instead, we see the ways in which, not just at the time, the broader infrastructure of white supremacist violence was left untouched, but all the ways in which the 9-11 yes. era that yes. comes later exempts that terrorism from so, its gate. So the 9-11 era exempts that as you say, exempts that era from its gaze. It focuses on foreign wars, foreign terrorists. In your book, you interview retired General Stanley McChrystal, the former uh, Joint Special Operations Command and Afghanistan War Commander. You write, asked if these efforts had been worth it. McChrystal replied, it would be impossible to argue that it was. The outcome just hasn't been positive enough to argue that. We just made so many fundamental mistakes. Uh, some honest words there from McChrystal. Do you think the majority of DC, the political establishment, the national security hawks, do you think they've recognized this too? Or is there still a sense that, no, we had to do this and we did kill bin Laden and it was worth it? I think there's probably something in the middle between those two statements that's going on here. I think, you know, certainly over my time as a reporter interviewing a lot of these people, there isn't and there has been, you know, for a very long time, a recognition that the wars really have been a disaster. There's just no jump from there to examining not just in a root cause way why they were a disaster in the full scope of what the disaster was and who it was visited upon and who it was not visited upon and more importantly that there should be any reckoning with that disaster which would involve probably people who are architects of that disaster 
perhaps, you know, at a minimum facing political consequences and not working in this town again, or in some cases, the cases of the most brutal and the architects of the greatest brutality of the war facing legal consequences and criminal penalty. The Washington foreign policy establishment, ascendant in both parties, is generally willing to say, oh, this was a disaster, oh, you know, mistakes were made, but to locate the source yeah. of those mistakes on peripheral characters in some cases, uh, people like Donald Rumsfeld, in whom they could pretend the war was somehow glorious, if not for this one, you know, fool and knave. But very often, the disasters are most often blamed on their victims. And we saw that a lot with Iraq, so with American hawks who had been, in many cases, you know, enthusiastic about the prospect of an unprovoked war of aggression and occupation in Iraq, then turning on Iraqis who they felt were insufficiently grateful for having their lives destroyed. Yes. Yeah, Dick Cheney and others saying we're going to be greeted as liberators. That didn't really always work out. Uh, the angle your book takes on 9-11, which is so interesting, is it, is it shows how it led to Donald Trump and what we saw unfold on January 6th. And you use one story in particular, uh, the Ground Zero Mosque in New York. That was a community center focused on kind of interfaith outreach and prayers for Muslims. It was weaponized by people on the right and later Donald Trump, Islamophobes. You write, quote, the transformation of that, what was called a Cordoba house, into the Ground Zero mosque mark the moment a presidency like Trump's became inevitable. Do you believe there is a straight line from 9-11 and the institutionalized Islamophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment and the rise of Donald Trump in 2016, 15 years later? Quite a straight line. We can see through what the politics unleashed by 9-11 were. Think back to that. There is a gauzy impulse uh, in, I think, American media culture as well as American political culture to remember 9-11. 11 is an awful day that led to a restored sense of national unity and purpose. It did no such thing. What it did instead was unleash an impulse very common amongst nativists that said, America, its way of life, civilization as you know it itself is under siege by an unfamiliar foreign menace that shares none of your values and wants you dead. And these people aren't just overseas in places like Afghanistan and Iraq that you may or may not care about. They're here. They're people who you uh, probably don't suspect are yes. plotting to replace your constitution with Sharia law. I think a lot of people in the press took that kind of statement, statements like the hysteria at the Ground Zero Mosque, statements like uh, the movement to ban Sharia law in a variety of uh, state legislatures as just sort of obviously absurd. Yeah. But what they really were, were in attempts to ensure that there was no space in American public life to be an American Muslim, that the atmosphere of suspicion around American Muslims after 9-11 would never fade Which... away. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.